Hello. Hello. Yay. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see so many of you. Um, my name's Beth Toms, and I sit in the people team here at Monzo. Can I get a show of hands, first of all, um, of those of you that woke up this morning and instantly took their phone? The majority, hands down. Can I get a show of hands who left the office last night and checked their emails? Slightly less, but still quite a lot of you. Um, in the, in the age that we live in, it's super hard to switch off. You are constantly on your phone. You can work anywhere in the world at any time. And when you care so passionately about what you do as a job, work doesn't seem like work. It's your passion. And so um, what we wanted to do tonight was to bring together some people who are so passionate about improving mental health across the world um, and really want to change our view of mental health. Um, at Monzo, we are so passionate about trying to talk about it. Um, luckily, we've got defaulting to transparency as a, as a value, um, but we care deeply about making sure that our Monzo Noughts are supported and that they can talk and, and feel like they have that, that care. So tonight, as, as part of Mental Health Awareness Week, we are super excited. And we brought together some amazing, inspiring people who have put together organizations or are just completely passionate about making sure that mental health is spoken about. But also, they are, they're doing it very differently in terms of their approach and making sure we it, it relates to the world that we live in, so using a smartphone. They appreciate that. So I am super excited to announce um, our first speaker just before I do that. Um, sorry, <laughs> a little bit of a build up. Um, we have a whiteboard just next to the bar uh, near the plants. And what I would love is if you, throughout the event or at the end, you put on a post-it note, something that you can action, something that you've taken away from this event and you're like, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Um, mine is definitely to keep doing headspace before I go to sleep so that I can actually sleep and not dream about Monzo. Um, so I would <laughs> love you to all have a read and also take an actionable point. Um, but I hope you enjoy this evening. So first up, we have Petra. Um, she, I'm not sure many of you have listened to it. It's fantastic. Please do. Um, she's doing the, the, the host of the Spotify playlist, Nailing It, which is um, tech and startups. It's super exciting. So um, over to you, Petra. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Petra. I, I noticed you avoided saying my surname. That was probably wise. Um, it's Belzebor. Um, happy Mental Health Awareness Week. Woo! Come on, bring a little life into the room. It's 6 p.m., 6.30. You've had some sushi, so you should be okay. I feel like I'm a stand-up. That's not what I'm here for. Um, so my name is Petra, and um, the podcast that we recently did, I was able, as part of a series with Spotify, the, the, the podcast was called Killing It, Adventures in Startups and Mental Health, and I was able to interview uh, the COO of Monzo, who is at the back of the room now. So if you haven't heard this podcast, it's so exciting because it's really people at the top of their game, leaders uh, in startup industry, uh, who are talking vulnerably and openly about their mental health. And that is the thing that I am passionate about. So what I've not had is any instructions about how to change my slides. I can just get a, yeah. So um, why is it, do we think, that mental health is so much on the agenda and that 70% more young people, children and young people, are experiencing symptoms such as depression and anxiety within their lives? Why do you think that is? Any thoughts? Any takers? So, social media? What did someone else say? Pressures? Yeah, so, so there's, there's so much going on now. There's something great about the openness and the willingness that we have to talk about these things. Um, but equally, there are a lot of pressures. Um, and so the, the world that we live in is moving at a faster and pa faster pace. Uh, there's noise all around us, and it's great that you uh, use the example just of our phones and how we automatically access that kind of uh, uh, support or um, work so immediately. But what kind of happens to us is... Unlike back in the day when we had a fight or flight response that just really helped keep us safe, 
Um, these days, it's as if our fight or flight response is off, you know, just because something's come through our newsfeed, even though we're actually essentially safe completely. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we're constantly, our cortisol within our bodies is constantly, the stress hormone, constantly moving up and down uh, as if we're unsafe when actually we're completely fine. So this kind of pisses me off, right? It pisses me off. Our brains are not designed to make us happy. What? They taught me some th stuff in books that I read and in the media that my brain, if I did everything right, was just gonna, I was just going to achieve happiness at some point. Unfortunately, our, what, what do you think our brains are there for? Survival. Survival, exactly. So they're there to keep us safe rather than to make us happy. But that does mean, this is sort of a relief once you know this, because it does mean that you do have some control in your life of your, your mindset and how you choose to look at your, your brain uh, and how your thoughts impact the things that you do. So one in four of us will experience a mental health condition. You guys are aware of that statistic? Yeah, everyone's aware. Um, but four in four of us will experience uh, mental health, right? So all of us need to be responsible for our own minds and how we look after ourselves. So we do all have mental health. So par part of what I do is I'm a mental health consultant. I'm a therapist. I'm a life coach. I do lots of training on things around mental health, but really the undercurrent is around empathy and how we have human connection. And I believe that it's very important for us to lead by example in being vulnerable and brave and telling our stories so that we give permission to other people to do the same. So before I get you to talk about yours, um, I want to tell you a little bit about my story and what got me to be so passionate about the work that I do. Um, so these are my parents. I know I look just like my dad. <laughs> these are my siblings. Remarkably, I'm the odd one out in our little group of United Benetton uh, Colors kids. Um, so I was born into and raised in the infamous Children of God cult. Has anyone heard of it or aware? couple people in the room. Um, don't Google it. It will just waste your life. Um, so it is a little bit sensationalist to put some of this up there. The Phoenix Brothers, Rose McGowan, they're well-known people who there's loads of uh, news articles about their uh, involvement as children. Um, so, you know, you know how sometimes I wouldn't say that I'm the one in four as far as a diagnosable mental health condition, but as we're all the four in four, every once in a while life just kind of punches us in the face. Has anyone ever been there? Yes, quite a few hands going up. Um, so life just punches us in the face, and then sometimes it just like steps on us as well. Um, and how do we you know, train our brains in order to cope with that and deal with those sorts of challenges? In the middle, we've got um, Ricky Rodriguez, who, is the, who was the son of the founder of the cult, two years older than me. I knew him well. Um, and the thing that makes me really sad uh, is that people in my generation who were raised the way I was felt trapped in their own minds, even though they left sort of an organization like that, um, and were never able to come to terms with the things that had happened and able to grow into successful lives because they didn't realize that they had choice at that stage. So um, Ricky is all over YouTube, and he uh, ended up putting a bullet in his own head. So I realized it just got dark there for a minute. Um, but it's moments like these that allow me to appreciate that certain things that have happened in my life have allowed me to learn and develop my own mindset uh, in order to be successful and not have to feel stuck in that sort of way of thinking. And so the next picture captures me at my darkest point. Um, uh, the, the shaved head was more a social experiment about whether blondes have more fun. Um, uh, they do. With, with, with enough attitude, both can have more fun. Um, but it's sort of, the, oh my goodness, the person who took this picture has also passed away um, due to complications of alcohol addiction. Um, don't worry, this is going to get uplifting, I swear. I swear. Um, but what's interesting, and the reason I show this picture, is because this actually isn't the picture that captures when I wanted to end my own life. This is. Isn't it interesting when we put the most effort into being okay and looking okay and acting like absolutely nothing is wrong with us, that actually our world might be crumbling underneath? And this is where having conversations that simply ask people how they are, waiting to hear the answer, but equally asking again if, it, if the natural answer was just, I'm fine, right? Um, 
So I remember very clearly, that the, my daughter's 12 now, uh, I have a son who's 14, um, but I remember very clearly waking up one morning and just staring at, you know those moments you have in your life that are just catalyst moments that can change everything? And I woke up and I stared at the ceiling, it must have been 6.30 a.m., um, and I realized that I wanted the day to end before it had even begun. You know how you can get a feeling of frustration maybe at 4 or 5 or 6 p.m., sort of after your long day is working and checking your phone? But when you have that moment of complete despair the first time that you, you wake up in the morning, my God, you, you think something's got to change. And so actually what I did was I gave myself a year deadline. Um, so I, I don't talk about this very much, but I gave myself a year deadline. And I said, okay, in a year, I can end my life if that's what I'm going to do. But I did notice, I saw people like some of you who were walking down the street and who just looked happy and looked, how, looked, like, looked like they'd figured this thing called life out, right? And I was like, oh, if they've got it, then surely there must be something that I can do that will allow me to learn how to be happy, to learn to override my brain that's just trying to keep me safe and thinks it's always in danger and allow me to grow into the person that I can become. So I dedicated that year to educating myself, studying, um, learning, observing people who were happy, uh, and, and trying to figure out what it was. And so we've got the Killing It podcast over there. I'm very proud of that. The picture I'm most proud of is this one. And anyone who takes education for granted um, know that not everyone has those cards given to them in their lives. So we were given the education of life, which I can now appreciate, has allowed me a head start in understanding people. Um, but when I was in my depths of despair with no education and no direction, um, oh, I hated you people who had education given to you on a plate. Um, but that was the result of working full time, raising two kids, uh, recovering from alcohol addiction myself, um, and just telling, t saying in my mind that this would be a window into better opportunities. So it was something I simply had to do. And I would wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning so I could get two or three hours of study in before my kids woke up, because that's how determined I was to get my master's degree. So I've taken a first step and given you a little hint into what life was like for me and what is possible if you simply learn and observe and think about your mindset and how you can change things. Um, so in order for me to catch my breath and compose myself, right? Um, I'd like to ask you to do something for me, if you could. Um, so all I want you to do is answer this question, and I want you to speak to the person next to you in twos or threes, just for two to three minutes, and answer the question, how has mental health impacted my life, okay? So if you're brave, talk about you, but if you're a bit like, ooh, a bit too much, I don't know who's sitting next to me, um, then, then talk about how mental health has impacted you. So it could be that you've had um, a, a sister, a father, a, a colleague, somebody who's struggled in some way and that you've witnessed this because it has impact us, impacted us all. So two minutes, talk to the person next to you. How has mental health impacted your life?
Hey, everyone. Is it on? Okay. Thank you. Back into the room, please. So, can you, thank you. Uh, these conversations are going to continue, right? Uh, throughout, your, uh, throughout the evening. Uh, can I ask you to stand up if mental health has impacted your life in some way? Look around the room. Now I just want to make you stay standing up. You can sit down now, thank you. Um, uh, it's just really useful to get a visual image of how relevant this topic is and how much it affects all of us and how if we could, in the same way as physical health and, and uh, exercise is taught in schools, within reason, um, if, if we put the same attention into our mindset and thinking about empathy and how we connect to each other, I think we'd be a much happier place. Um, so finally, I want to just touch on some of the tips that have supported me through my journey. Um, are you guys aware of Carol Dweck and the growth mindset? A couple people. Um, if you're not aware of her, you may be doing it already without even knowing it. Um, but it really was useful to me to understand that I could nurture my brain and shift it from being in a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. So the fixed mindset was being a victim, feeling trapped, feeling like this was the only way, you know, this was the only life that I was ever going to have, feeling angry, bitter, all that stuff. It was all real closed thinking that didn't have much hope. A growth mindset allows me to know that my brain can, if I nurture it and if I teach it new habits, it can completely change the trajectory of my life through doing different things. The other thing was observing people that were doing it well. You guys aware, you, everyone knows Tim Ferriss, yes? Yes, lovely. Um, his, his book that's really as big as a phone book, so I keep it more as a weapon than anything else. Um, Tools of Titans, he's, he's got so many clips on YouTube, but the main thing is he studies and researches billionaires and titans, as he calls them, successful people, on what are the habits and routines that they put in their life in order to be successful. And some of those seem quite straightforward and even physically healthy as far as our well-being. But we've got to get it in our minds that our, our bodies and our minds are connected, right? It just seems like it's common sense. But we seem to separate them out so often and think that if we're not eating healthy or looking after ourselves, then our minds are actually going to flourish. When sometimes that works when you're 18, it does. Um, but not forever. Um, so 80% of people had some kind of mindfulness practice, whatever that looks like. Most of them had a morning routine of some kind, whatever that looks like. They, they had ways to make sure that they had the right amount of sleep. They looked after their diet. And then I love the, the sixth one, which was consciously deciding on our day. So going back to that first slide about all the noise that we have in our lives, when we don't consciously decide, we're kind of making a decision to live our lives by reactive processes. So that anything that comes our way, we just firefight, firefight, firefight. So that we're constantly in a fight or flight which can be very familiar to us, but not necessarily useful if we want to change our path in life. And I love Tim Ferriss's quote from the book, you don't succeed because you have no weaknesses, you succeed because you find your unique strengths and focus on developing habits around them. The superheroes you have in your mind are nearly all walking flaws who have maximized one or two strengths. Everyone is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Everyone struggles. Take solace in that. Um, the, the reason this speaks to me is because the, the image of me when I was at my lowest was, you know, showing that, I, that nothing was wrong. When actually, when I start talking about my story, it's quite unique and different um, and insane. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so these are some of the ways that I was able to just practice doing, doing mindfulness in the morning, even though my, all of my senses in my brain was telling me that this was ridiculous. Because I had to sit with myself. And it's the pain sometimes of sitting with ourselves when all our feelings and emotions come up that we've used countless ways to numb, whether it's your Netflix or your alcohol or your numbing things through, through addiction or through, you know, you, you all know what I'm talking about, the unhealthy ways that we avoid dealing with stuff. Um, those are the things that can hold us back. The other one is just acting as if you're a scientist or a detective. And if you feel stuck, sort of imagining that you put that sort of hat on to practice things that work for you. For example, lots of people love Headspace. 
L lots of people love Headspace. Lots of guys lo love Headspace. Um, I love Headspace. This is on YouTube. I love Headspace. Um, but it's f about finding what works for you. So if one thing doesn't work for you, it's not about scrapping the whole method. It's kind of going, OK, well, that didn't quite work. Let me try it in a different form and see if that works for me. Consciously deciding on our media consumption. If you want to reach for your phone first thing in the morning, by all means, do. But try and make a decision about what the impact might be and the things that you prefer to do. Lead by example is the, the key one. So many people in talk about loneliness within London and big cities and talk about um, being unable to connect. And I will say to them, well, I connect with people all the time. I don't understand. I'm not saying I don't experience loneliness, but I do connect with people. And that's often because I start first by asking a question or showing up as myself, and that gives other people permission to do the same. And finally, you guys must be familiar with the five ways to well-being. Connect, be active. Um, all of them make sense. Do them all. And the one that I think is underrepresented is the giving back. When I was um, in uh, addiction recovery, uh, they would say that if you were one day sober, you already had the edge on the guy who just walked in. Right? So you had, it was required that you would be giving back to the guy that just walked in. So you constantly had a sense of service and needing to give in some way, which is why I've always mentored a few teenagers. Or This isn't like an ego thing. It's like this helps keep me mentally healthy. So think about a way that um, you'd like to stretch yourself because uh, you know yourselves better than others. So finally, before I end, I'd like you to talk together one time. Keep my microphone on um, so I can yell at everyone. Um, Talk to the person next to you and just say, what's the one thing that you're going to do from this day forward or develop into to improve your own mindset and look after your own mental health? One thing, when we say it out loud, we commit to it. So go ahead, two minutes. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to get you back into the room. Can I get... So, so many ideas here, I love it. For the sake of everyone, just as we close, can I uh, get one or two ideas of what people are going to commit to? Just raise your hand. Yes? <laughs> What's the one thing you're going to do to look after your mental health? Lovely. Thank you. Can anyone top that? Can we get one more? <laughs> Can we get one final one? Someone brave. Yes. So I heard that she's going to look after herself, eat well, not be rushed, and uh, consciously make a plan for her day. Yes? Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I appreciate you so much. I'll be back for the Q&A later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Petra, and thank you so much for being honest. Um, right. Hello. Um, thank you very much for sticking around and for you know having a nice drink with everyone. It's nice to be out when it's nice weather. I am Tara and I'm the um, head of people at Monzo and the reason that I'm doing the Q&A is because I'm the person who launched mental health first aid at Monzo. So mental, um, you know, supporting people with mental health issues and making sure that we have a supportive environment and that our employee experience focuses on mental health is really important to me and that's why I'm the person who's going to ask some questions. Um, before I get started, I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to ask questions they might have. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask our lovely panel once I've introduced them? Think about it now so I can come back to you. So lovely Petra. Rose. Rose. Oh, do you wanna you got one? What are we doing? <laughs> what? what are we doing, sorry? Gavin. <laughs> Jared. And I'm Tom from Monzo. 
Yes. Tom is not the only Tom at Monzo, as you may know. He is TFC, our lovely COO, and he's joining us on the panel for now. So does anyone have a question they want to kick us off with? Box. While we're waiting. Um, I have a question for Jared here. Um, over the last few months since the app has been running, have you seen more people swiping up instead of swi swiping down? Uh, so, like like I said earlier, we do not gather any personal information about people, and so um, we really don't know what people choose as far as um, their moods or their their overall uh, entry. Uh, we just know that people create entries, and we don't know what's in them. So, unfortunately, I can't say. Does anyone else have a question they want to start off with? Oh, OK. Um, I'll repeat your question just for the live stream. TFC, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. So basically, the question is just um, how do you celebrate um, success without kind of sounding arrogant? Um, so we have, uh, I was kind of chatting with a few founder friends uh, last night, actually, and um, they were talking about um, the main meeting that they have um, as they're all hands, and it's a kind of let's go through the numbers and see how we're progressing and, and so on. Um, we do something quite different. So we've got our executive committee, which we uh, now invited all the team leads to, and that's the uh, sort of let's look at the content and um, uh, figure some stuff out and challenge stuff. Um, and then we've got an all hands on uh, a Wednesday evening, which is all about celebrating success effectively. Um, so it's just this great opportunity. It's massively upbeat. It's demos. Um, it's shout outs. Uh, we even have a, a channel on Slack called Yay. Um, where you can literally go on there and be smug about something that you're really chuffed about. And so it might be you passed your driving test, um, or it might be you bought a house, um, or it might be you just totally nailed an Excel model. Um, and I think that if you just create that environment, um, then it's fine. It's like it's great. To, success is great. And um, you know, if you get this opportunity, it's, just, it's literally showing off in front of the rest of the, the company and say, this is this thing that I've done, and it's, uh, it's really cool. Um, for, I think people kind of like it. Gavin, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think just to add to that, it's kind of, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. Um, you know, you don't go shout about successes, but if it's coming from other people, for me, that's that's a lot easier to kind of take and give pride on. So, like, it's quite good sometimes to, like, talk about someone else's successes on their behalf, and then they do so on other people's behalf. And I think that way you kind of get to know that they've done well, and you get a bit of gratification when someone else is giving you that kind of, uh, gratification not coming from yourself because it is, I mean, you do always play down something that you've done well naturally because you just don't want to come across as egotistical. So I think it's, yeah, it is just a natural thing. Yeah, actually, just to add, we've uh, got a channel called Gratitude um, where you can go and give major grats to, uh, I, I, I'm the only person who uses that expression out of the <laughs> 300 people and it just hasn't caught on, but um, that it is a place where you can just go and say, hey, Georgie absolutely rocks. Um, she did all these things that are just great. And then we all just chuck uh, love hearts and Monzo logos on it. So um, yeah, that's it, another way. I mean, I prefer yay because it's all about me. <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Um, I would just say uh, a lot of the partners or the businesses that we work with, you know, they have that same problem of like um, when they've been working with us for a while, like they feel a bit weird going like, yeah, we care about mental health and yeah, we're doing all well and they can, they can see like happiness grow in their company. I would say to you like, if, you're, if you want to celebrate your wins, as long as it comes from a humble place, then it's fine. Like don't feel bad about celebrating your wins if they're great. If, like, if you worked hard, then just celebrate it. I don't know. For me, it's like super simple. Just on an individual level rather than an organizational one, when we 
lead by example, we create change. So there's so much habit around um, saying, you know, oh, how was your day? And assuming the, the it was so shit answer. And let's talk about how's dating. Oh, fucking Tinder. Um, you know, we, we assume that we're going to talk about the negatives. But like with my kids who are 14 and 12, at the end of the day, I say, what went well today? Just to pitch it differently and start somewhere else. So sometimes we've just got to start with asking the question and it comes back to us the other way. Wonderful. Do we have any more questions from the crowd? Okay, over here. You can throw it. Throw it. What I yeah. love about these oh. events is we always find... <laughs> That's very loud. Okay. Um, this is kind of for any of you, but maybe the people who have more of a technological background instead of looking at mental health. Um, how do you work with mental health professionals to give the best care? Because obviously you might not have the relevant training. And how do you kind of build that into your business models to make sure that you're giving people the right advice in the right way? Jared, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah. Um, it's a very... It's, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, that was one of the things that we really had to work hard on and you know from a development studio we were very used to like moving very quickly and in lots of iterations and really getting things out there that maybe weren't completely finished could potentially lead to harm and so there was a lot of education on our part, learning from our partners and being humble in the fact that, you know, okay, we don't know everything at this point, that we need to learn this and that we, we are going to grow in this way. And so I think from, from our standpoint, that's, that's kind of the direction we took with it. Kevin? Yeah. I mean, for us, there's... So our app works where there's completely humans on the other end. And these people are individuals as well. And I think people just assume people are counselors or listeners, but these guys go through men's health problems as well. And I think from early days, we were like, look, if we don't treat the people who work with us well, then what's the point in then going out and trying to get other people to use it? So we have a, a clinical psych who, Anne-Marie, she's incredible. And she, her, one of her main roles is making sure that our counselors and listeners are happy. And, and are happy in the way that they're delivering and just just happy in themselves because I think I think everyone knows if you're not happy in yourself you're not going to be able to give you know your best at work or you know your best ability and I think it's I think people do forget that you know counselors need counseling um, and that's that's really important so any other questions from the... okay I'm gonna go to the lady in the back and then to you in the front okay Thanks. Um, hi, so I've sort of got a double question. Um, I think the first one is, so we really resonate um, in our company about sort of you're the same person at home and at work and you should have that space of being your true self uh, wherever, wherever you are. Uh, but more from an organizational perspective, um, I was very curious to understand, Monzo, how you guys um, deal, what, what's your approach with mental health in the workplace? Like how do you make your employees feel supported in that regard? And then more towards Sanctus, um, it was great to learn about you guys and what you do, but I'm not quite clear on like what your philosophy towards mental health is. Like, how do you get people to open up? Um, you know, what what is your approach in that regard? More, like, and yeah, your philosophy. So if we get a bit more detail about that, it'd be cool. Well, should we answer the first question first, and then to Rose, TFC? Um, so the question is, um, how do we support our em employees in terms of mental health? So, um, I reckon there's probably two different um, approaches. One is around culture and the second is around benefits. Um, so culture is the, actually, let's, let's talk about benefits because I think that's the, it's the easiest one to, to go with. So um, we have done a few things uh, which mean that when you are having some challenging times, um, you've got some, uh, some, some different routes to access. So we have mental health first aiders. Um, as Tara was, was saying, and so um, and I kind of love that. I'd never even heard of the concept, um, but it didn't, doesn't take uh, too long to figure out what it is, um, and uh, it sounds kind of good. Um, we picked a healthcare provider um, in, in terms of kind of the health insurance that covers mental health. 
Um, so uh, a, a lot don't. Uh, we picked Vitality, and um, I think that's it. again just kind of sending a, the the right message, um, and means that kind of people have uh, have that opportunity. Um, we now work with a couple of different organisations um, that we can kind of direct people to, uh, including Spill. Um, so again, we're kind of just kind of giving people um, the, those avenues. On the culture side, that's much tougher to to get to, and it's difficult to sort of break it down. Um, and it's got to start somewhere. And I guess the place you'd start is at the top with the leadership. So you need to create um, an atmosphere where it's okay to be completely transparent about this. In fact, um, be vulnerable. Um, and I, a lot of leaders, especially kind of founders, don't don't want to do that. The, the whole point is. Um, you're indestructible as the the founder. You're the person driving this forwards, and um, you know something that um, that goes against consensus, and that everyone else doesn't. And um, you know you can't fail. And so it's very weird to then mix that and have to stand up in front of people and say, ah, actually, I'm I'm kind of failing in myself at the moment, and I I need to kind of figure out a, a way um, past this. So. You know, someone in our um, senior leadership team stood up and said, hey, just so you know, I'm, I'm seeing a counselor. Um, and I find it a bit weird, because I'm trying to figure out what questions they're asking me, why they're asking me those questions. Um, but I'm giving this a, a go. Um, I did the Killing It podcast and then just sent that around the company and just kind of said, look, this is um, some, some stuff about how mental health is, has affected me. Uh, we've created a Slack channel, because we have a channel for everything, <laughs> it seems, um, called Mental Health. Um, and some of the stories on there are just I just put my hand on my heart and my jaw drops at the, the vulnerability, um, the fragility. The people are so open. And when you do that, it's an invitation for other people to do the same. And it's like, OK, wow, I wasn't going to go there. But if, if this is where we're going, then it's on. Right, Here, here's what's happening with me at the moment. Um, and it's just OK to say, I was not functioning as a human being last week. Um, thank you so much to my manager, um, who just kind of made it all feel great, and now I'm back. Um, so that is hard, uh, but it starts from somewhere. I think if you, you lead by example, then um, you kind of go from there. Ambrose, about Sanctus. So I feel like you had like two questions. Right, what was your question again? <laughs> Around uh, your philosophy towards mental health, like how does Sanctus approach um, getting people to open up and create that safe space? Because yeah, just more about that. How do we do that? Um, so I'd say our philosophy on mental health is basically the same thing that I think we've all said is that everybody has mental health. Um, so I think that's a great starting point. The way that we get people to um, open up in the businesses that we work with is exactly what Tom was saying. It has to start from leadership. Um, so most of the time when companies do come to us and they say, like, I want Sanctus in my workplace, we have a really honest conversation with the leadership to make sure that that particular leader is actually, do they really, really, really care about taking care of their employees' mental health or is it just going to be a bit of a tick for them? Because if it's going to be a tick, um, when we started out in the early days, we, we would work with companies that it became a bit of a tick thing and we would notice that because leadership wasn't bought in and they didn't really care, the things that our coaches and we as mental health professionals were saying, they weren't buying into, they weren't really executing it in the way that you really need to in order to make your employees feel like they can be vulnerable with the coaches that we offer to them. Um, so after we've had that really kind of like good conversation with them, then we can start to integrate what Sanctus is. The workshop, the intro workshops are a really good example of how we say to all of the employees, like, this is a safe space you can use it for whatever you want. So not everybody wants to talk about their mental health in terms of deep psychological childhood trauma. Not everyone wants to go there. Um, so basically what our coaches um, say is that I am a trained professional. I can hold a space for you for an hour. You can bring whatever you want to. It can be something like a petty squabble you had in the coffee room. We can talk about that for an hour if that's what you want to. Or if you want to bring something a little bit deeper that you really want to work on, then I'm also here for you. Um, but it's one of those things as well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So, you know, you as an employee can have access to your Sanctus coach, but also if you don't want to use it, then and you're not comfortable with it, then you don't have to. We're not going to force that on you. Um, but one thing we do start to see is the more... Um, 
you know, one-off workshops that we do in particular workplaces, the more we get the employees in certain companies being mental health advocates, and whether that's because they came to an event of ours and then they took some photos of it and they saw it on social media and then their colleagues saw it. It's kind of like that trickle effect. The more and more employees go to a Sanctus session or a Sanctus event or, or start talking openly about mental health at work, then somebody else who was a bit more reluctant to use the Sanctus coach is then going to go, actually, do you know what? I'll try it as well. So, yeah, basically, role model, implement, and champion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this gentleman by here had a question. My question is um, So my question is particularly addressed to mood notes in that I was very struck by the uh, seven mood states which you uh, identified. And I was wondering... Um, as with the rest of the panel, through feedback, have you discovered that there's a particular sort of ideal state in which to be productive or record your own emotions or a one to seven equally valid and sort of, um, if not desirable, acceptable? And pe people are not working towards being one state rather than another. What, what, what's your experience on that? From the mood notes standpoint, we, we kind of feel that... Um, Nobody's going to be happy all the time. You know, and we're all different, too. And what happiness means to me is going to be very different from what happiness means to you. And as far as an optimal place, I wouldn't say necessarily that, uh, as Mood Notes is concerned, that we have a place that we're trying to get people to. We're more focused on making people aware of their own thoughts, their own feelings, and helping them to evaluate those thoughts and feelings in the context of their life that's going on around them. And then to build from there what they think is the most appropriate, appropriate thing. Um, you know, and that may be with a a psychotherapist, or that may be with, you know, just their friends around, too. So it, we don't try and drive anybody to a specific goal or a specific end. We just want to make people aware of their own thoughts and feelings. From a psychological perspective, uh, absolutely everyone is individual. Um, so it is about self-awareness, like auditing yourself. When are you the most productive and what conditions were in place in order for that to, to occur? Um, I can sometimes have a blazing row and then do my best work ever um, just because of my adrenaline's pumping and I choose to focus it in that way. Um, but self-awareness is key because I need to listen to my intuition and my body if things are tipping 10 steps before before anything goes terribly wrong. So it's kind of that, it just really enhances uh, that knowledge of yourself and what works for you. Wonderful. Um, gentleman, the green shirt, who's got the catch box? Uh, hello. Uh, firstly, thank you, Monzo, for um, providing this and all the panelists and feel very inspired. Um, so um, I work as a wellbeing coach within one company. And so this is to all of you. Um, so I provide mindful sessions and one-to-one -one coaching, but I have a real problem with gender divide. Um, I feel like females are way more open to it. You know, if I do a mindful session, it's mainly girls that come along. So I wasn't sure if you had any insight with this or any tips for me and everyone here how to engage more men. Yeah, TFC, do yeah. we start? Why am I starting this? Uh, <laughs> I. I feel like there's a real lack of male role models who open up about their feelings and there's just this cultural, um, it, it, the stigma is just enormous and I just, I can't think, even with my friends, like closest friends, we just don't kind of go there, you know? Um, even if it's totally miserable, it's like, how's it going? It's like, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, and you actually think, I'm having the worst year I've ever had in my life, and I, I, and I didn't kind of tell my best friends about it. So that's a real problem. I, I was, um, this is going to sound totally bizarre, but I was just really proud of Prince Harry when he said, hey, I, I, 
went through mental health problems and, and it's like, ah, right, you know, finally somebody who's just um, famous, who, who just says it. Um, and he's a guy and he's been in the army and he's royal and I, I like royals, so um, I just thought that was cool. Um, so I don't know what you can do to make celebrities all talk about uh, their mental health, but it just, it feels like maybe even just within the company, if you can get some of the male um, significant people with influence to just open up, I wonder if that would help start that that journey, that process, and people just kind of think, well, if he's saying that, you know what, I've been through this too, I want to talk about it. No, no, you go. No, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, there's not a right answer to it. I think looking long term, it's probably just going to be a societal shift that just brings, and it, it's happening, like you can really see it happening. Um, more men are talking about it. I mean, not enough, but more men are. And I go back to kind of, we're in this room, we're all pretty privileged, and we're having this conversation, so everyone's aware of it. But you know, you go down to the council estate or you know, the lower paid workers, that's where the real, real problem is. And that's where you're really not getting the, you know, the, the man who's working. That's the problem. And it's until society makes it okay. I mean, Prince Harry's great, but he's not gonna, you know, he's not gonna reiterate the kind of message that that person wants to hear. And it does come back to role models, but it, eventually it's this societal shift and it's making things available to these people. Um, that's there earlier on, but and yeah, it, there's just no right answer, and, and I think that's the unfortunate thing. But the positive thing is, it's moving in the right direction. We're talking about it more than we've ever talked about it, and I think you know, from a positive outlook, it, it is moving that you know in the right direction. I don't have a perfect answer, but one thing that we um, do at Sanctus, at least with my community hat on. Um, we identified this problem exactly. A lot of the events that we host are mostly women and, and mostly white women as well. Um, so what we've basically done is we've looked at this problem and we're like, okay, well, if we um, kind of like quick little tiny solution, if we can't get the men to come to the events, why don't we host an event that's mental, men talking about men's mental health and masculinity and the problems that they have faced there? Um, and that's, um, that's going to be in a couple of weeks' time. It's facilitated by our coaches um, or one of our coaches, and it's free. And honestly, like, we opened it up to our community, and within, like, a couple of hours, um, the first round sold out. So sometimes um, we found with our community, it's a lot about permission giving. So when one man goes, like, yeah, I'm feeling really crap, um, another guys go, yeah, me too. And then I see them meet up for a coffee and then they send me an email a couple of weeks later being like, thank you for putting me in touch with so-and-so. Um, I cried about problems that I'm having with my wife for the very first time and I didn't even know this bloke like, uh, like three weeks ago. Um, so sometimes, I don't know, it's an interesting thing of like sometimes you need people to just go there. So if you know that you as a, as a guy in front of your guy friends can go there, you might actually be that tiny little step. That's something that happened um, for my partner quite recently, and he's a, literally like emotionally constipated. Um, <laughs> so to hear him have a really like, yeah, yeah. To hear him have that conversation with his uh, male uh, housemate uh, about what they did was really um, encouraging for me, and he did that all by himself. So yeah, anyway. Yeah. I'll just add to that. My previous job, I was clinical director of an employee assistance program. So similar to like message uh, uh, therapy, telephone therapy, uh, the, the range of men who accessed a service like that was quite high. And equally, as women, I work with construction companies and I, I train their leaders in mental health. And if you imagine the oldest school tradition around men don't cry or show any weakness, as a woman, I am able to tell a bit of my story and allow them to do some exercise to talk to, talk to each other. And one out of four will talk about the experience that they've had. And it's such a moving experience. So women can play a part in giving men permission to talk to each other as well. Um, we'll go here and we'll go to one more question about to close, okay? So, uh, at the back. So Everyone who comes to our events are much better catchers than actual Monzo employees. <laughs> um, I'm always massively impressed, so well done. So I have a question for Spill about that. 
What, if anything, are you doing to ensure that you are matching people with counselors who will be receptive to them? For example, an LGBTQ person with somebody who is supportive and affirmative, or a religious person with somebody who is supportive and affirmative of their sense of their background, or a black and minority ethnic, whatever. Yeah, yeah, no, no, completely understand. So I think where we are as a company right now, we're very early stage. So our our primary concern is getting people in touch and getting you know people talking. But you're completely right. So we're bringing in surveys uh, at the start of, before you kind of start talking to someone, a kind of about who you know you would prefer to talk to, whether it be a male counselor, you know, a female counselor, et cetera, et cetera. And then we will do our best to then match you with who we have as our bank of counselors and do so. But I think, yeah, it's it's so important that you find the right counselor. And I think that's that's the key thing sometimes. It's great talking, but talking to the right person, and that can take time sometimes. But once you get that relationship, you know, it's like an ongoing relationship that you do have, and you confide in that person so much. Um, but yeah, it, it's so important to be be finding the right right uh, partner. But we are doing essentially what we can to do that. We encourage you. Um, if you include, think about non-binary gender and outside the gender binary from the beginning, it would be no. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, completely agree. So we might need Thank to do like one throw to the person rather than like. Who, who's it? Coming down here. Thank you. Um, this is just more of a, a practical question, I think, for each of you about uh, screen addiction, mobile phones. But it'd be really interesting to know about, from, on a personal level, how do you kind of manage uh, social media, WhatsApp, Slack, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, that type of thing. Um, FC, do you want to kick us off? How do you manage your Slack? Um, yeah, I sort of think about the worst times uh, in my life where um, where work had really taken over me. Um, and Slack, Slack initially was amazing because it's like less emails, um, but then just the instantaneous nature of it um, is a kind of a killer, and you never get on top of it. You know, inbox zero is one thing to try and aim for, but clearing your Slack is um, uh, is kind of impossible. Um, and what was screwing me over was I had Slack notifications on my phone, and it was just this non-stop ticker tape that just never ended and went through the weekends and went on your holidays and, and so on. Um, so I decided to, I've kept Slack on my phone, so Tom, our CEO, has actually um, uninstalled it. I've kept it on my phone, but uh, removed notifications. And so now for me, it's an active choice. Like when I need to go in there and get something, it's convenient that I can just get in. Um, but I'm not just a slave to this, or it, even worse, you know, it's so passive that it's just there and still commanding you, and you're like, ah. <laughs> so um, I think that that's kind of helped things. More tips? Because <laughs> I, I can go all day on this stuff. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, you're right there. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. It's so hard. Um, and I have, you know, the, uh, an addictive trait. So uh, as much as I know all this stuff, it's like just the thumb thing. Just like, it's just there, right? Um, so sometimes I just need to have a clean break because I took Facebook, Facebook off my phone and then I just looked at it through my browser, right? Um, <laughs> like constantly. Um, so I, I need to sometimes, in the same way that sugar can have an addictive quality to me, I need to take two days where I abstain completely in order to then get back on a healthy sort of conscious decisions about how I do it. So in the same way, take notifications off, definitely. But I sometimes need to take 24 hours or 48 hours um, of a clean break in order to then just reintegrate and go, oh, how do I want to use this in a healthy fashion? Because it does have that cycle for me. Two microphones. Um, so I manage all our social media accounts. I also moderate all our Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, whatever. And I do our mailing list as well. Um, and I've also been a social media manager for about two years now. So I have, um, in the beginning, I had a really shit balance with social media and my phone because I was constantly on it. Um, if I'm honest, the turning point for me was, yes, deleting some of the apps off my phone that, if you know, I didn't really need there. Um, not literally giving myself the permission to not give a shit about Instagram and Twitter notifications. I know that sounds like really brutal because it is my job. But you know what? That retweet or that like or that follow, 
I know it's not going to help me in the long term. I'll wait till I get into the office in the morning, and then I'll look at all of them in one go. I'll post what I need to, and then I'll say goodbye to that channel for the rest of the day. Because constantly looking at my phone, like I can feel this buzzing underneath me, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, God. You get that dopamine hit, and you get so, so addicted to it, and then you get to the end of the day, and you're like, well, at least I was jerking for that that need. As soon as I just said to myself, like, it's not, no one's going to die. It's going to be fine. Social media has only just been new, and humans have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. I'll be all right. Um, so just don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> Jared? Would you like to hear? Um, yeah, I, you know, delete the apps. I, I am very... Um, I'm very picky about who I follow on certain social media. <laughs> I think I've pared my Facebook down. I've deleted it from my phone, but yeah, I, uh, the web browser. I, I've pared that down to just my family. That's it. Um, Instagram, just people I know. Twitter, very, very small people that I find interesting. Um, and then no notifications. Uh, as far as Slack is concerned, you know, they have that do not disturb in there that's on as soon as I leave our studio and I don't get email notifications uh, I actually have a separate email client on my phone that I use for work and I don't get any notifications from that because I don't want them um, so when I leave the studio for the day that's it it's it's done I did the massive extreme and I just deleted absolutely everything from the actual accounts and it was amazing. I, it's so refreshing to be able to do that and do you know what I found? I found that I started using LinkedIn as Facebook. It's got the news feed, it's got everything and, <laughs> and that's the problem. I was thinking, oh great, I've got rid of everything. But yeah, and even that now, I've just completely toned it down, don't really use it that much, which is stupid for business but it's great for me. You know, it really is and I think there's something in a notification that's really powerful I think as humans, you get excited that someone's kind of buzzed you or messaged you or, you know, there's something that's relevant to you. So we've done the, the kind of biggish thing of the app. We don't have notifications on the app at all. You don't have the choice of it. And it's, it's quite annoying sometimes for people because they they're not aware that someone's messaged back. But we just think people get so many notifications about everything. You know, the, the list of stuff is ridiculous that if we are just that space where people go when they need to go there rather than, you know, being a prompt to be there, then it, it's a bit more powerful. And people go back to see what message is there when they have the time to do it and when they want to do it rather than being prompted to do it. And I think that's, that's been quite effective for us. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just, just being able to switch it off, I think, is key. Question over here. Hey. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, Right, thanks um, for um, all the information that you guys have shared. I think it's been really um, insightful. Um, I've kind of got two points. One a question, one sort of just a general point. Um, I, I personally, I'm, at the moment, I've, I've come to care a lot about mental health through uh, my own sort of personal um, route into it. Uh, and as a designer, I've sort of um, started to explore the idea of using AI or machine learning um, to be able to accomplish um, things which otherwise we couldn't, um, you know, in a sort of privacy-preserving way. As um, you know, you mentioned uh, at the moment, the way Mood Notes is, you can't really uh, do that. So that's something which I'm sort of personally pursuing, and I think, um, and I'm hoping, and I think it's going to um, sort of have um, some really interesting um, outcomes. So if anyone's interested in that, just come, come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, the question I have is um, incentivization, or has to do with in, uh, incentivization. Um, a lot has been mentioned, sort of tiptoeing around the, uh, the time that we live in, the society. Um, you know, there is a divide, uh, and it seems to be getting even worse, you know, between those who have and those who don't financially and power and all that. So, you know, we here are fortunate um, to be here and exchanging ideas and living in London, etc. Um, and possibly, you know, being in a position to go to a Sanctus, you know, open um, thing to be able to talk about it. But I think what would allow us to get it to even more people uh, is creating a sort of uh, incentivization scheme 
kind of in, in the same way with physical health, uh, with uh, apps or um, projects like Limpo, for example, within the crypto space, which actually give people um, uh, sort of a monetary uh, reward in terms of uh, keeping healthy. I think uh, if there's an incentive to actually, you know, keep uh, your mental health you know, as an individual and also sort of as part of a community um, better, I think that would um, be uh, quite helpful. So I'm just keen in terms of like, what are your different approaches um, from an incentivization standpoint? Am I gonna be able to have a pot in Monzo to, you know, to kind of go towards my mental health or something? Um, yeah, sorry about the long question, but yeah, that's it. Petra, do you have any thoughts on that? It was a, a lot. Um, incentivization, I mean, in, th in theory, it, it sounds good in the same way of physical health. The thought running through my mind is there's, there's a really high statistic, I don't know if it's double or triple, of um, people who are in debt and, and how their mental health uh, sort of gets worse. Uh, I'm also thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of need, where you need the, the shelter and the food and the basics in order to then be able to think about self-actualization or self-awareness. Um, I just remember going into a school and doing a talk, and they brought me in, and they said, do something on stress and mindfulness and uh, teach them about stress and resilience. So I was like, great, you know, year, year 10 girls, uh, let's talk about that. Um, and they were all literally like, deers in the headlights, right? And I was thinking, so, you know, this mindfulness stuff, have you guys ever tried it? And they went, yeah, we did it that one time during exam week. Um, and I was brought in during exam week. So that's not building up anybody's fortitude to, to build their resilience. It's just saying, here, let's do that tick box. Um, manage your stress, but when they're in the middle of a fight or flight response. Um, so I don't, that doesn't answer your question. It just adds more layers to the, to the problem. Um, but there is something around information and the ripple effect of leading by example. There's, there's, I mean, I'd love to be involved in the conversation of how do you incentivize in, this, in a similar way of, as physical health. Yeah, I, I think in this country, if you're really going to catch the lowest people in society, it's got to come from the government first. And in that sense, um, education everyone always talks about it but it's so important but from the youngest possible age you know we're always taught about healthy eating i mean in school now five everyone knows about five a day but you don't know the five things today to do for your mental health and if it comes from you know a young age at every single school not just you know a, a posh school or anything like that it needs to it needs to start from the youngest possible age and then that goes forward to you know the biggest employers in terms of people like people like Tesco and stuff, they they employ people from you know shelf stackers to to CEOs, and the people in the head office have great mental health support. But what about the people on the checkouts? What about them? You know why are they not getting the same support? And so there's an employer's responsibility that everyone across the company has the same. Um, and once that starts, it's just starting that that same message. I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to say about how Sanctus would think about incentivization. But when you're going to that point of like, why is it not talked about in schools? Um, Sanctus do a little bit of um, like on the content side of things. We work with micro influencers um, to basically talk to their followers about like their own mental health experiences and get people to basically like role models. So I think seeing role models is kind of incentivization, probably not the same that we're used to for our physical health. Um, but um, when you were talking about um, you know, why don't the shelf stack us at Tesco? You know, if we started working at Tesco, Sanctus would want to roll that out to the shelf stackers as well as the CEOs. And we have just started working in a call center with one of the companies that we work with in Hull. So these are very like working class people who don't have the same privileges and the people in the HQ office. Um, and they've literally just, they've like ran to it and like their, their slots are booked up from the moment we open it. Um, because once again, like it, it, some some people, if you give it to them, they're going to use it. Um, but no, I don't know what we do about incentivization. I haven't got a really answer for it, but I think great great question though. <laughs> Just want to add to the school's point that it's it, the education is wonderful and magical, but I think it should start with the the teachers and the stress levels on uh, in that level. Because it, again, if you lead by example and show your vulnerability as a teacher, that ripple effect is so much more profound than a just a government initiative, even though it should come from all sides, right? 
Uh, like everybody else, I do not have an answer to your question, but I'm going to pose another thought to you that uh, a friend of mine messaged me, or well, she, she posted it on Twitter uh, a few months ago. Um, what if the panic attacks that I have on a regular basis are the correct response to the society and the environment that we've created as, as a culture? What if the depression that comes along with that is the correct biological response to what we've created as a culture? And if that's the case, how do we change the root of the problem and really not just put a Band-Aid on, on the, what's going on right now and change what we're doing as a society and, and as a culture? We've had some really, really great questions. I'm just going to take one more. And if you do have other questions, the panel will be around to mingle and ask your questions there. So who wants to ask the final question of the evening? This gentleman over here in the blue cap. A lot of pressure. Here you go. Catch it. Yeah. Um, so as a developer, one of the uh, things I seem to do is I lock myself in a dark room, do some work, yeah, you know. Um, uh, and then I say to myself, I've got no friends. Nobody likes me, blah, blah, blah. Um, how can I get out of that cycle? Because I never seem to be able to do it. And that's the whole panel. Right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a developer, yes. Me personally, um, Find other things that you're passionate about. Find something that, that you can do to help others that takes your mind away from yourself and helps connect you to somebody else. You know, maybe it's volunteering at a food bank or something like that. Um, yeah. Find a way to, to connect with somebody else in a way that you're giving to them. Um, for me, uh, it's my kids. When, when I need to decompress, whatever, we lay on the floor and we color. <laughs> we put Legos together. We do things like that. Um, yeah. Find something that you're, you're, you're giving to somebody else. Yes, give. That's so profound. Um, just, just know that your habit is now ingrained into staying in the dark room and then going, oh, what's happened? Where are my friends? Um, and so it, initially, in order to change a habit, it's going to feel hard. And I remember interviewing uh, Tom on the podcast where he had this fabulous idea. I'll let you to make sure I got it right. But um, where he maps out the perfect week at the beginning. And so he's consciously deciding on the important things that he wants in the week um, before, before the week has even started. And then everything else has to fit around that. Did I get that right? It's beautiful, right? Um, so because if you just wait for the feeling that, you, that life sucks, then you're not going to do anything about it because you're not going to feel like it. So you're going to watch Netflix and eat pizza and the cycle will continue, right? Um, but if you consciously decide that this week I'm going to go to this class and I'm going to do this volunteering and I'm going to talk to somebody even if I don't feel like it, the feelings are going to come later. So you've got to just do the thing in the knowledge that connection is key for fulfillment and good mental health. And the feelings will follow. So schedule it in, math it in, do it, go outside, um, and your life will change. Um, well, can we first give a round of applause to Naji and Beth for organizing this fantastic event and bringing everyone together? <laughs> They've worked really... And also then to our wonderful panelists for don't, um, giving us their time and all their wonderful information. And now, everyone, stand up, stretch, chat to one another, and make use of the people who are here. Thank you.
<laughs> gonna readjust the back now. Yeah. Are we? Are, are the audience allowed to? Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>